Today on That's Classic, we have none other than Pat Priest, um, who is here for, you know, she was on the Munsters and she's had just a prolific career and it's just fantastic to have her on. It's, it, uh, we went through a, a few things, but we've got her on and we're, we're quite excited. So thanks for being on, Pat. Well, thank you. It's my pleasure. Well, de definitely. It's, it's just awesome to have you on. So Pat, if you would, um, I'll tell you what, why don't we start off with how your first audition went for the Munsters? Can you tell me what that process well, was like? I had been working in Hollywood, I mean, doing lots of commercials and lots of bit parts and and uh, lots of uh, just, just uh, guest uh, spots on shows. And uh, the girl who was playing Marilyn on the Munsters was leaving after the first 13 weeks. She was going back to uh, New York. And mm -hmm. so they were uh, holding auditions and there were five of us that were auditioned. <clears throat> Excuse me. There were five of us that were auditioned. And this was on a Wednesday. They called me on Thursday to tell me I've gotten the part. Friday, I went in and signed the contracts. Saturday, I mean, Monday, I started work. Oh my and gosh. I never met Beverly Owen. She left that weekend. And of course, she's passed away in all these 58 years. I've never seen her or talked to her, which would have been nice because we shared a common experience. Well, definitely. And did, did she ever attend any of the uh, fan conventions or anything like that? No, no. And she did not sign autographs. Mm -mm. Oh my when gosh. She left, she left. Wow, that really is something. Yeah. Now you said there were five women. Um, who who were some of the women that auditioned with you? Uh Diane Foster, Don Wells, um myself, uh I can't remember the other I two. Gotcha. Don Wells. I mean, that I have to admit, I did not know that that Don Wells had auditioned for that. Um, well, you know, and interestingly enough, I had also introduced, I mean, I uh, was interviewed and tested for Gilligan's Island. Oh, my and gosh, you're uh, kidding. We were, uh, there were also, I don't know, four, four or five of us tested yeah. at that time. And the interesting thing was we were sitting there, you know, waiting to get tested. And uh, in came this girl in a little pair of short shorts and her little ponytail out to hair out to either side with a drop dead body. And all of us, we knew each other from, you know, doing commercials. We looked around and we said, who is that? We'd never seen her before. Wow. Uh, she happened to be Raquel Welch. Oh my gosh. Oh my and, gosh. And, um, she did not get the part. Of course, Don Wells got it. And, uh, but that was interesting. That was the first time any of us had ever seen her. Oh my gosh. That's really something. I mean, yeah. the fact that you were all floating in the same circles too, you know, it's just. Well, it's we kind crazy. of, you know, I was thought of when they call for a Doris Day type. Mm -hmm. Well, 200 of us would show up. And wow. of course, you know, we got to know each other and, and, you know, and especially for commercials, you know, they were looking for young mother type person. Mm -hmm. I yeah. fit the bill. Wow. Wow. That's pretty awesome. Did So how was that first day on the set? I mean, you're dealing with, you know, Yvonne DiCarlo, who was a major film star. You're dealing with Fred, Fred, yes. Wynn, Al Lewis. Come on. I know but it was yeah. interesting because the very first day on this set, now I have never met Yvonne, <clears throat> and the very first day, Yvonne and I, one of the first scenes that they were shooting was Yvonne and I in a shared scene in the uh, entry hall, you know, where the, the stairs and all right there. Yeah, by spite. Yeah. I was standing and we were in a shared scene and the director says, Pat, come a little bit closer uh, into the light. And I stepped forward 
And Yvonne turned to me and she said, let's get one thing straight, young lady. Don't you ever upstage me. Whoa, <laughs> I jumped back and I thought, I'll do the rest of the monsters in the dark. <laughs> but you know what, Yvonne and I got along very well. We went to lunch quite frequently and uh, we had boys about the same age. So we, you know, had a lot to talk about and we got along. Oh, that's great to hear. Did she but, ever you know, talk? You learn how to, you know, you learn right away. Sometimes if, if she wasn't in a good mood, it might be three o'clock in the afternoon before I'd say good morning. But, uh, you know, you just, you kind of took your signal from her. And that's why I, I was not controversial. I never argued with her or anything. Hmm. And uh, it, was, it was lovely. We became a family personally, as well as professionally. Really? Which was really nice because um, uh, Al had a, a boy, the same age as my boy. And uh, Fred had children, but the same age. And um, so it, it was really nice. And we were just a little family. Would, would you bring your families to the set? Uh, no, I never did. No, never I, did. I got you. When, when you met with Yvonne for lunch, by the way, did she ever talk about any of her you know, Hollywood past, like, I mean, she was in Salome and she, I mean, she was in- Oh, I know, no, all of them. she never did, no. Wow. I, mean, I knew all the wonderful things she did. We talked more about what we were doing on the set and also, uh, you know, what was going on with our families and our children and that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Did you stay in touch she with- uh, she done. Oh, I see. Did you um, uh, did you stay in touch with most of the cast after the Munsters was over, or or? No, no, I didn't. I didn't. Um, Al and Fred moved to New York. Yvonne moved up to to um, um, what's the little uh, village there in the like oh, Solvang up up in that area? Yes, yes, yeah. Solvang. Thank you, senior sure. moment. Okay. Um, she moved up to Solvang, and uh, I then when we made the TV show called "Here Comes the Monsters," mm -hmm. why um, I, I hadn't seen her in probably I don't know ten years or more. Wow. It was fifteen years after we did the show, and they picked me up in the limousine, and we went to where she was staying and picked her up. And I said, well, I'll, she was staying in a hotel. I said, well, I'll go in and I'll go get her. And uh, so I went in, I, I knocked on the door and she came to the door and I put my arms out. I said, hi, Yvonne, it's so good to see you. And she stood back, she went back on her and she said, who in the hell are you? Oh my <laughs> gosh. I said, oh, come on, it's Pat, <laughs> Marilyn. Oh, 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 I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. I haven't seen you in a long time. I said, oh, that's understandable, no problem. Wow, that is that but is I kept in touch with Al. Uh, Al was my mentor. And I kept in touch with him uh, regularly. And of course, but knowing Al, he was not a great phone talker. And he would call me periodically. And he'd say, hey, how are you? How you doing? And I'd say, I'm fine, Al. How are you? Oh, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Yeah, I just called to see how everything was going. Bye. <laughs> and oh, that was my the, gosh. I, I do. I know his wife, Karen. And uh, she wrote a wonderful book about the Munsters. And I did the forward in it. And uh, so I kept in touch with her. She lives up in uh, the Oakland area. Oh. And, and of course, you know, Fred has passed away. Right. And, uh, but I do talk to Butch all the time. We did shows together a lot. 
But then when the pandemic came in, yeah. um, then I ceased doing it because, uh, you know, I've gone through I have cancer and so therefore I have an impaired immune system. So I have to be very careful. So I just kind of stopped. I stopped doing the shows, but I talked to him periodically like just the other day. And I said, where are you? And he said, I'm in Arkansas. So he's busy. He bought yeah. the two cars. And so that opens up a whole new venue for him, mm -hmm. you know, going to auto sh uh, car shows and things. Yeah, no, he's he's terrific. Butch has been on the show. He has been a great supporter of, you know, my show. And uh, I, I he's just a, a super nice guy. I had the I had the pleasure of meeting oh, his he sister is. as he well. Is. And just great. Just great. They both are wonderful. Yeah. And and as I say, he's he's so kind with me and and uh, I would love to maybe be able to go out and at least do one more show. I love doing the shows. Yeah. I love meeting the people. I love talking with them. The hardest part about doing a show was traveling to get there. Yeah, I know. You know, I come out of Idaho and it's a couple of plane changes. And if one plane is late. Yep. And, you know, it fouls up everything. And right now that's happening so much. Oh, my and gosh. It's, it's really bad. Out, I, I may come out and do one more show. Okay. Well, I'm sure your fans would definitely love that. Believe me. So when Fred when Fred was alive, um, I noticed that it, it appeared to me that he kind of distanced himself from the monsters, like almost mm -hmm. like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Why was that? Very much so. When the monsters was over, Fred did not want to be thought of as Herman Munster. And he wanted to, to, to establish himself as a more serious actor, which he did. And oh, he yeah. did wonderful things. But afterwards, he was at the point he would have nothing to do with the Munsters. He would not even stand beside Al Lewis for a picture. And they were best friends. Oh my gosh. Just, and he never signed any autographs. Uh, he he felt that he was playing a comic comedy, a comic book character. Wow. And he didn't want to be thought of as that. I thought it was one of the most brilliant performances. Oh, by all means. Anyone has ever done. I mean, it was he and they tried to you know, reproduce and they try to get people to be like Fred, but I don't know <laughs> there is anyone no. like Fred. No, he, 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 was, he was a genius and not only in his acting, but he wrote and illustrated children's books. I didn't know that about Fred. Yes, he, he uh, was, in fact, I have one of his books hmm. and uh, wonderful the, the judge and he he played the guitar and many times when he was not in a scene he'd be sitting in his little dressing room on the stage and he'd have his guitar and he'd be playing and composing music um wow. he was a very brilliant man you know he went to harvard and he got his start in a hasty pudding review and then oh my course, gosh John, New York to do Stalag 17 and many other things. Wow. I he didn't, was I didn't, that executive. He was with J. Walter Thompson in New York. He was? Yeah. Oh my gosh, that is something. Wow. So, you know, he, he has had a very um, interesting career and he was certainly multifaceted for sure. Right, right. Did now I had heard, and and I don't know if you have any that come to mind, but I had heard that the two of them, uh, Fred Fred Gwynn and Al Lewis, they were kind of pranksters on the on the set. Um, oh, is that true? Absolutely, they were always putting every each other on <laughs> and teasing each other, and they were also 
putting me on because I believed <laughs> everything they told me. And so they were always, you know, telling me something. And whenever we travel, when we go off on location, I always rode in the limousine and they always put me in the middle. And when we went to lunch, the commissary, every you know, week we filmed, I would always be in the middle and I would go in and sit. You know, we had a round booth in the commissary and people would say to me, after, oh, how can you sit there and, and, and eat with them when they, they, they look so ugly? I mean, how, and you know, it just goes to show. We would sit there and talk about our kids and what we did last weekend. It just goes to show when you take the time and you get to know someone, mm -hmm. none of color, deformity, whatever, none of it makes any difference. Yeah. It's all, yeah. It's all the soul behind it. Oh, that's, that's a wonderful, wonderful moment. Jeez. Um, oh, it I, is. And I loved it. I loved it. Oh my gosh. And now that's what I love about you. I love about Butch is there's such uh you you carry the legacy of the show so well. It's just really impressive. Now, I another thing I I heard and I know I talked about this with Butch a bit was the makeup that they had on was, oh, was quite a quite an ordeal, right? Oh, absolutely. I was so fortunate because at the end of first of all in the morning I was only a half an hour in makeup. So I could get in there like, you know, seven o'clock for yeah. eight o'clock filming and no problem. And at the end of the day, and sometimes, you know, we'd run till seven, eight o'clock. I could get in my car and drive home. Wow. It took um, Fred two hours to get into the makeup and an hour to get out. Oh, wow. Just so we could go home. Wow. You know, um, and it very, and Yvonne too, it was very hard on their skin. I was very wondering. hard. And I think they were glad to see the show come to an end uh, after two seasons. Uh, not because it wasn't popular. The mm -hmm. reason it ended was because Universal owned the monsters and mm -hmm. CBS owned the, the rights, you know, for filming. Mm -hmm. And um, and it was on the CBS network. Uh, CBS wanted to go in color and they wanted Universal to foot the bill. Universal also wanted to go in color, but wanted CBS to foot the bill and they could not get together. And oh so CBS gosh. just said, fine, okay. And they canceled this. Oh my gosh, that's why it was all canceled? I was all over going in color. Oh my gosh, I never, I mean, I literally never knew that. That that's crazy. Yes. Oh wow. So when when you were on the on the set, now obviously, I mean, it's it's no big secret that it was always like they gave you a few lines, a couple lines, that that whole book. Oh, yeah. Yes, yeah. I could memorize my lines in the car coming in in the morning. I lived <laughs> out in Thousand Oaks and it was about a 40 minute commute. So my lines were so easy, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Did you. Um... Occasionally they do a show around me, you know, yeah. a man from Maryland, from Ghost the Emerald. Those are a couple that were you know, predominantly, I played a, a, a bigger part. How did you feel on those episodes? Because I, I, yeah, I know those episodes you're talking about. How did it feel to kind of be like more the, you know, like featured person for that, for that episode? Oh, I loved it. I loved it. it yeah. It was nice. And I also liked just being, uh, you know, part of the family. And, and I enjoyed that too, you know. Right. What was the set like? You know, I, I I had talked to Butch a bit and, you know, about S Spike and just the, the way the set was laid out. I mean, it's it's one of the most iconic sets literally in television. I mean, they, there's some, I can't remember if there's somebody in Indiana somewhere. They literally built the entire Munster's house. It's that iconic, you know? Oh, yes. Uh, the the people, uh, Sonder and Chuck McKee, 
Yeah, they're there. friends of mine. We become friends over the years. Wow. And uh, Butch and I used to go there on Halloween. They they built an exact replica of the Munster House in Waxahachie, Texas. That's where it is. It's Texas. I said right. Indiana. And, yeah, and exact. Right. Yeah. They researched it for years, and they built an exact replica. And every and they lived in it. Believe it or not. Wow. And um, every Halloween, they opened it up to the public to come in and go through it and see it. Oh, wow. It wasn't a haunted house. They didn't portray it as a haunted house. And Butch and I came and we'd sign autographs, you know. Uh, That's awesome. But they had a big, beautiful yard and, and they had things and games for the children. And uh, I went there for about seven years. Wow, that's so cool. I wish I had Even after that. Butch no longer went. I, I would go there and appear. And it, it was just, you know, it was a wonderful. And now they're doing mystery dinners and things at the house. Wow, that's amazing. Did So when you worked on the, on the set itself, because there were so many, you know, I don't think people realize how many items there were like in the living room and all that. Did you oh. have to kind of like watch how you, you know. Oh. And it was, it was dirty because, you know, they blow the dust in yeah. around so there'd be dust all over everything. And uh, I know that, that Sandra McKee, if they're a house in Waxahachie, they bought a lot of the items uh, that were in the house. Oh, I didn't know that. From Universal, I don't know, an auction or something, but they bought a lot. And so, you know, when I'd go back there, I mean, it was deja vu all over again. Oh, that really is something. Jeez. Now, but, what, uh, was, what, what was... It was a very uh, intricate set. We had, we had <clears throat> the living room was on one stage, one. The lab was on another stage. And the bedroom, um, the Uncle Herman, now, that, that was on another stage. So they were different, different sets, sometimes different stages. But um, just, and then of course, sometimes we'd film, you know, at night and we'd film out in front of the house, which the house on the lot was only just a facade. It was just a false front. Oh, right. So yeah. that when we film outside and we go up the stairs to go into the house, open up the door and we'd step. And that was, you know, you, you're out in the pasture. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, by the way, spot, which has always been like, you know, I mean, especially as a kid, I always thought that's so cool. Yeah. You know, spots. Are the what was that? Like, what did you well, actually see? I, I, I hate to, to, uh, spoil someone's illusion, but Spot was a tail, two light bulbs, and a, a flame, a, you know, shooting flame. Wow. That was it. It was not anything else. The only thing that you ever saw going around the corner or whatever was the man mechanical tail. And then when the steps went up, you saw the eyes, which are light bulbs, and spewing out the flames. Oh, is that funny? Wow. Now, you all saw the tail going around the corners where you thought, <laughs> wow, this has got to be a big, big item. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I had my imagination went wild when I when I used to watch that. Yeah. Well, you know, we had um, our most expensive shows to film, which um now is probably half of mm -hmm. what a, a star's salary is to do a show now sure i mean our most expensive show to film and it was always the show with special effects wow. and of course the special effects then we're talking now 58 years ago yeah were totally different than the special effects, you know, today. Oh, gosh, yeah. 
come on without a doubt did you did you by the way get any of the props from the monsters no i didn't no uh, and do you know what you know i made a lot of mistakes in my life um when i would finish on this set on friday night we go home there was a great big garbage can right beside the stage door so i just tossed my script in the garbage can oh wow did not save a script did not did not save anything oh my god and, and um years ago after i moved up to sun valley idaho um <clears throat> our neighbor was van williams who was the the Green Hornet. Oh my gosh, yeah. And, and Van was not only our neighbor, but our friends and his wife. And he was my husband's hunting buddy. And so Van used to go out to do shows all the time. And he'd say to me, um, you know, Pat, you should be doing these shows. And I said, really? Well, what do I have to do? Wow. And he said, well, do you have any monster memorabilia? And I said, no. And he said, do you have any pictures? And I said, no. He said, well, um, do you know Kevin Burns? I said, yes. I can remember Kevin Burns, who is the largest monster collector in the world. Right. Um, when he was eight years old, he came on the set as a guest of Fred Gwynn's. They started a relationship. Fred also did caricatures and so did this kid and he invited him out. So I said, yeah, I've known him since he was eight years old. He said, well, he has most of the photos and all from the uh, monsters. Um, can you get in touch with him? I said, sure, I'll call him. So I called Kevin and I said, I'm going, I want to start doing some of these shows. Can I get some pictures from you? And he said, absolutely. So I was coming down to California and I told him, went over to his place. He had made all kinds of photos for me. Oh my God. And, uh, and then also, then I, I, and I, so now I had the nucleus to start. And I said, but I don't know what to do. And he said, I, I mean, I don't know what to get. I don't know what kind of pens or anything. And he said, well, do you know Barbara Luna? And, you know, who's on Star Trek and uh -huh. Ricky. And I said, oh, yeah, I know Barbara. And he said, well, call her up. She does a lot of shows. She'll help you. So I called Barbara and I said, Barbara, I'm coming down. I'm going to do a show. And, and can we meet and have lunch? And she said, sure. I need wow. to know what to buy. And so she took me to the stationery store and got me all set up with pens. And then I sat right beside her for my very first show in California. That is really something. That is really something. So did I, Van Williams, I mean, it's terrible. I haven't even thought, did he, um, did he pass by the way? Uh, yes, he did. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we, we drove down to Arizona. Uh, they have a place in Arizona as well as Sun Valley, Idaho. Uh -huh. And he was down and my husband and I, we drove down to go and see him. He was um, in an assisted living. He uh, had a lot of back problems and, gotcha. and we went down to see him and he passed away probably about six months after we were there wow well i'm glad that you saw him before yeah it's a, he, he, got, he started in the the, the the autograph business right yeah literally that's so wild that that was the green Hornet. i mean the green Hornet has always been kind of a special thing of my end too my last name's cato so i have oh, heard right. Cato for years yes. yeah <laughs> so that that's why it kind of my ear part you know I caught it I was like what um hey I have to ask you to Munster go home okay I I have read that you know 
which which by the way as a fan is so irritating but i had read that they were they didn't they basically didn't even offer it to you is that is no. that right no the, not only did they did not do that they came down not the producers some assistant or guy in their office came down on the stage to tell me that I was not going to be doing it. That wow. was all. No reason why. Now, Al and Fred went to bat for me, but I, we found out bottom line what it was. Uh, I was under contract and my contract was uh, up at Universal. Uh, and okay. so in order to do the Mungusters, they would have to renew my contract. And they had a contract payer, Debbie Watson, who was under contract, who was uh, with them. And um, they decided they were going to use her. It would be cheaper. And they felt she was younger. Uh, I was 29 at that time. Yeah. They felt I was too old. Of course, oh. I wasn't too old to be Marilyn. Exactly. You know, when <clears throat> exactly. Closed, but two weeks later, I was too old. Yeah. And um, and so they used Debbie Watson. It broke my heart. I mean, I was, I mean, no, the producers, nobody came to tell me. No, just they sent someone from the one of the associate producers down. And oh my gosh. Told me on the set. Yeah. I mean, I I you know, Hollywood is a business, but when you hear oh, stories yeah. like that, it's just, it's so hard as a fan to hear that kind of stuff, you know, it's just. A yeah, it was, it was, yeah. but I well, went you... on to do other things. I got involved in, I started flipping houses before the term flipping was, was ever know? invented. Yeah. And I did that for years and, and. Didn't you, didn't you do, uh, didn't you also, weren't you in the, the, the Elvis Presley uh, film too? I was. Easy, easy, easy come, easy, easy come, go. Easy come, easy go, story yeah. of my life. Yeah. Um, yes, I, I did. And, and you know, it was so interesting that you should mention it because just day before yesterday, I went to see the Elvis movie and I no. loved it. I loved oh. it. Um, there were things that I thought maybe they could have put a little more emphasis on, but but overall, it was well done. It was a great movie. What and was he like? He was wonderful. At the time, he was quiet, shy, religious. Mm. And... Um, Priscilla was very much in the picture. In fact, I think after we finished filming, she never came on this set. I never met her. They married shortly after we finished filming. That was in 67, wow. 1967. And uh, like, I'll tell you an interesting story. Sure. Uh, we were sitting on this set. We were filming outdoors and we were sitting on our chairs. And I was sitting right beside Elda's. And we were chit chatting, and I said, Oh, I'm, I'm looking for a car. I'm, I'm going to go buy, I'm gonna buy a new car. And Elvis said, What are you going to buy? And I said, Oh, I don't know. I have uh, gone out. George Barris, who did oh. the Monster Coach, George said, Well, whatever you buy, we'll customize it. And I <laughs> said, Okay. And he said, uh, Well, would you like to buy one of my cars? And I said, oh, well, it was number one. I couldn't afford it. But number two, what is it? <laughs> yeah, of course. He said, I have a 1967, uh, 65, uh, black Cadillac Eldorado convertible with oh. a black leather interior. Oh, and what I, a car. I said, oh, um, I, I couldn't afford that, Elvis. He said that was three thousand dollars. I said sold. <laughs> wow. So I bought the car. But you know, at that time, I wasn't. I was married and had a couple of children. I was never into 
and collecting or, or, you know, I never had him sign of anything, autograph anything. And um, it just, I didn't think about those things. So I drove the car for a couple of years and then I traded it in for <laughs> a Pontiac, a Pontiac um, GT. And then George Barris customized it. He did a custom ton of top and what have you. But uh, yeah, just traded, did not trade it in his Elvis car, just traded it in. So that was the first retirement fund I threw away. Yeah, first, I've thrown several <laughs> retirement funds away because I mean I'm just not thinking. I mean, my husband said, "Oh," and I hadn't I hadn't met my husband then. He said, "Oh boy, if I'd known you, that car'd be up on blocks in a storage unit." <laughs> oh my gosh, without said, a doubt. Well, you know, my timing. I didn't get the timing gene, so it figures. Yeah. But you got the but experience. It was a wonderful experience. I I loved it. And uh, seeing the movie brought back a lot of great memories for me. Was he a what did you did, was he an easy actor to work with? Did he what? Was he an easy actor to work with? Oh, Elvis? absolutely. Absolutely. He was always on time. He was not a diva at all. He, whatever the director said, you know, extremely easy. I would never have expected it. When he came on this set, he walked in, he had all of his guys, 10 of them, all of his guys came with him, the pack. Wow. And they were all terrific guys. They were wonderful. I enjoyed and liked them all. Hmm. And they all, you know, had functions, business functions with him you know, music, his chef, his bodyguard, whatever. And uh, they, were, they were wonderful. Did the colonel ever show up? No, no. Wow. And, and you know what? I didn't even know what the colonel looked like. When I saw Tom Hanks, first of all, I thought, I've just seen Best Supporting Actor Award. Wow, wow. Uh, he was phenomenal. Wow. Um, but the no, he never... He never came on this set at all. Not oh, how at all. interesting. Did, um, you know, Elvis, obviously, everybody's going to, is, you know, wondering, but was he, like, when you saw him, was he just, like, a stunning guy to see? Like, yes. was He, he was. Because this was just prior to his marriage. Mm -hmm. So he didn't get into the drugs in Vegas till a few, several years later. Right, and that, right. Of course, was the beginning of his downfall. No, good looking, nice, polite, lovely. Wow, wow. You you were in many things. Uh, I, I mean, I, I looked at your resume. I was like really blown away. I, I saw everything from Bewitched to the Jack Benny show to Lucy to the Red Skelton <laughs> show. I mean, There's a lot. What can you give us like a little quick uh, on, on, you know, on a few of them, like what was Red Skelton like or, or Jack Benny? What were, what was oh, that? Oh, like? Red Skelton was, Red Skelton was wonderful. I did a couple of his shows and I remember, you know, how we, we just sit and talk while they were lighting and doing things. And especially one was a bar scene and it was, yeah, and I was a gal in the bar, but all in costume Western. Uh -huh. And, and we were chatting. He said, you know, you remind me of my my wife that passed away. You oh, just wow. remind me so much of her. And I said, well, that's a lovely compliment. Thank you so much, Brad. And it was fun working with him. Uh, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Wow. You know, we laughed the whole time. Oh, uh, that's pretty cool. What was, what about the Jack Benny show? Any recollections on that? Oh, no, I, I did a little side skit. So it wasn't exactly with Jack Benny, but it was on his show, you yeah. know, with his people. It was just a little side step. Gosh, I got that you. Was so long ago. <laughs> well, hey, you know, we're pulling these out of the air. Why not? Um, what yeah. about what about Bewitched? We I have a lot of uh, followers that are are really love oh, Bewitched. I, I love what? doing Bewitched. That that was fun. I played uh, 
one time I played as secretary and Tapava had reduced my little boyfriend to a little miniature guy. <laughs> and, uh, and then also I was bought, I played Dr. Bombay's nurse. Wow. And um, that, that was interesting. I kind of started, you know, when I started, I did a lot of Dr. Kildare's mm -hmm. and I was a nurse. And um, um, Evans, oh, the gun played on Dallas. Um, oh, uh, the, uh, uh, you mean uh, Larry Hagman? Evans. Oh, I did, I did her first name. Oh, Linda Evans. Linda. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, now I've had two senior moments. Okay. Linda Evans. Linda and I used to be. We used to, but she was working as a nurse also. And we used to sit in the back behind, you know, on a chair back waiting, you know, for our scene and chit chatted. Both of us were just, you know, doing bit parts. And and yeah. um, she tested for big, that big valley, so did I. Wow. But, you know, there were kind of a little group of us and we just kind of run around testing for everything. And, and it seemed like all of us kind of in the little group hit on something. That's pretty amazing. I mean, it really is. You, you literally all did. You're all, you know, you are. And you know what? I don't know that we could do it today. I don't know that it could be done today. Times have changed. Uh, movies have changed. Everything has changed. Yeah, I agree with you. I think that was a that was a golden time. I do. I I, I would agree. By the way, um, and whatever. I jump back and forth. But when you were on the Munsters, there were a lot of great uh, guest stars. I mean, Paul Lynn oh. was on there. Don Rickles. Uh, do you remember any of them? Oh, I do. Love Paul Lynn. He was always funny. I mean, he kept us laughing on this, you know, behind the scenes and all, and. Uh, Don Knotts was on, and Don Knotts and I became friends, and oh, really? we went to some functions together, and um, uh, yeah, we had a lot of wonderful people on, Don Rickles, and, and uh, big name people. Yeah, I, I I I remember that. Yeah, Don Knotts. I've I uh, I had Ronnie Shell on, uh, who is a friend from uh, Gomer Pyle, and he. Uh, he was very close with Don, and he he has said that he's just it was just a great guy, just a great oh, guy. Yeah. yeah, apparently very paranoid about about getting. And you still know, have stuff, those comic guy. comic guest stars on. Uh, it was always, I mean, it was, and of course with Fred and Al and their comedic and I mean, it, we just laughed the whole week. <laughs> Did you ever have an instance where you you were trying to do a scene and you were laughing so hard that it was hard to like they'd have to do yes. another take? Yes, yes, uh huh. And the darn darn be cut. You know, you got to get it together now. And then with all of us, we couldn't look at one another because then we'd start to laugh. Oh my gosh, that's funny. That is really funny. Any any other sh any particular episodes you remember that happening? Like if I went back to, to spot it. Uh no, not it's not as such. It would just yeah. you know, all the all the time. And of course they were always putting me on and and I I'd say you know something and then they'd they'd feed me a whole line of whatever. And I believe them. Right. That was right. The, I believe them. I heard that uh, uh, Al was actually, uh, and as you said, he was a mentor. I also heard that he was quite the human humanitarian. Is that true? Very much so. Yes, he was. He um, taught and worked with deaf students. Oh, wow. And um, also, you know, he was a, a, a basketball coach. Oh, I didn't know that. And big time. I mean, he scouted for the big professional people. And so he go to all he knew all the up and coming people, uh, you know, from the high schools, you go to the high school, everything. Very um, 
very well thought of and they, and you know helped in in people that were up and coming in the field but you know i tell you an interesting story we were going fred and al and i were going down to marine land mm -hmm. to do a special from there we were and um when we were coming back after filming, we were coming back again, as I say, I was always sitting in the middle and the other two on the edge of side. Yeah, yeah. And I looked over, we were kind of quiet and I looked over and I was looking out the window and tears were coming down his eyes. Hmm. And I, I, and Al was a little bit hard of hearing too. And I kind of poked Fred and I said, look, house crying and he said yes but we'll never know why oh wow yeah something he was he was a very sensitive uh very compassionate uh, giving man wow and wow that's quite a story that that wow that that's yeah he he seems like it the the, the other side of this um I, I noticed, uh, you know, there were, I mean, I, I remember in the stores, there were games, there were lunch boxes, there were, oh. I mean, oh. I remember a ton of this stuff. In fact, I know Butch has a few items, you know, like, like whatever. Of those. Oh, Butch has a lot. Butch has a lot. I have some lunch pails and books and puzzles and they have Marilyn Munster paper dolls and a, oh, that and, and bobble heads. I said, you know, my head's probably going to start bobbling now due to my age. <laughs> but, but bobbleheads and Marilyn Munster dolls and, and, uh, oh, but yeah, we never got anything on the merchandising. Nothing. Not on time. All of us. Oh, wow. Was, was, uh, Universal retained the rights to all of the uh, uh, mar marketing merchandising. Oh my gosh! I, I, not nothing, huh? That was there. I guess at that time, maybe that wasn't written in the contract, so maybe people didn't realize that. No, no, exactly. And um, you know, we were they they didn't, and of course, also we were we filmed from sixty four to sixty six. Mm -hmm. And so we worked under the old union contracts and, oh. um, you know, Batman and, and Beverly Hillbillies and the Kales Navy, we were all in that, in the sixties. And so we never got, we, the contract said we were paid for seven reruns per episode. Well, that was used up in about the first two years. Oh, easily. easily. And so now for the last 56 years, it's been on the air and still playing. Zero. 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 Oh my gosh. But, and then they came in in 1970 with Reagan when he was head of the, the union and totally redid the contracts and the residuals, but didn't didn't bring us in didn't uh no they didn't we we weren't grandfathered in at all oh my so, gosh oh my god so all these years why but you know you have to think in one respect that's why it's playing all over the world because they don't have to pay anybody residuals. You're probably yeah. right. You're probably right. Money. And universal because they don't have to pay anybody. Oh, and is that funny? So True. It's kind of a double hand sword. On one end, you know, it keeps us in front of the people. Yep. And for young generation to know the monster and younger people. And, you know, it keeps us out and keeps our names and our images and all um, yeah. out there for people. But I have to say, funny thing is, I'll be, I'll be doing a show and I'll be sitting there and some little kid old, probably, you know, eight, 10 years old will come up and they'll look at me and I'll look down at the pictures. I'll look back up at me. 
And I'll say, is that you? <laughs> and I'll say, yes, that, that's me. Well, it doesn't look like you. <laughs> and then I have to, well, would you believe that? That was 55 years ago. And uh, I was not young then. And, uh, and, you know, even though you're just seeing it maybe for the first time. Um, and I said, okay, would you believe if I told you I was Marilyn's grandma? He said, yes. I said, okay, I'm Marilyn's grandma. This is my granddaughter's pictures. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's so funny. Because kids are, they just say it. They don't hold back. Yeah. Well, and you know, children, when they're seeing it for the first time, now they think it's just, you know, been filmed. They don't know it was filmed back in the right. dark ages. And so they expect when they come to see you, they expect you to look like what they see on TV. Oh, is that and funny? Of course, I... that's where the pictures, the pictures are what? from the show and it's, and then of course the old lady sitting there but the pictures are from the show right because nobody wants to buy pictures of an old lady you know they, <laughs> they want to buy them from the show right right did um by the way a uh, couple of things about your past i i i, I pretty impressive you're with your mother uh, she was the united states treasurer is that correct yes that's correct and wow. then when she was, she was United States treasurer for eight years. And then she came out to California because of the Eisenhower administration was over. She came out to California and she ran, which was in a treasury of the United States was an appointed position mm -hmm. appointed by President Eisenhower. And then she came to California and she ran for the state treasurer of California and uh, was elected. And she was a treasurer for eight years. And then she was getting ready to announce that she was running for her third term. Wow. And uh, then she had had cancer 10 years prior and it had relapsed and come back. So she just retired out of office. So wow. she was, and, and mother was the, uh, she was with the Reagan when he was governor of California. And then prior to him becoming president of the United States, she did the nominating speech for him at the convention, the Republican convention. Oh my gosh, that is really impressive. What a background you have there. So um, what now, I, as far as acting, she's the, she's the uh, reason that, I mean, it appears to be the reason that you got started in acting. Is that right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and can you tell us about how that started? Well, Mother, our church, we're from Utah, and um, our church, they have what they call, in our, we lived in a little community called Bountiful, and in, in the community, there was at that time about six churches, and they had what they called a road show, and each church put on a road show, and then it traveled from church to church. It was wow. judged on content. It was timed, it could be 15 minutes. It was also judged on number in the cast and, um, and content. Well, they asked mother to do it. And because she took, taught a speech and drama class with, at the church, at the young people's group. Yeah. So she wrote it, produced it and directed it. And she needed, a three minute act or something to go on in front of the curtain while they set up the scenery. Oh, so wow. she came up with the bright idea that I, that she would teach me how to do pantomime and I would lip sync pantomime, a comic record. So, okay. 
So we got a record from an old British comedy singer called Beatrice Kay. And she did uh, comedy things. Yeah. And so we got this record called Hooray, Hooray, I'm Going Away with the Man in the Little White Coat. Halfway through the song, she starts to laugh. She's crazy. And she starts laughing and laughing. And of course, I'd be, I had the lip sync down perfect. <laughs> and <clears throat> I'd roll on the floor and laugh and hold my stomach. And then at the end, two guys in white coats would come and carry me away. But then, of course, then the curtain would go up and she had this, this scene all set. Well, we won it that year. We, we, we won it. Oh, but, my gosh. So I come to the attention because going around, then they wanted me for every Lions Club and Kiwanis and everything to come and be the entertainment for their meetings. I only wow. had one record. So I thought, I got I to gotta get some more. I got to get something else. So I did some more Beatrice Kay. And then I came to the attention of a man in Salt Lake City that had a show. His name was Eugene Jelesnik. He had a show and he was a violinist. Name. And I came in once a week and did a record fan line. Wow. Lip wow. sync now, it's called. And I did that. And uh, then, of course, you know, we moved to Washington, D.C. And, and then I did a local television show with another man. The Art Lamb show in Washington, D.C. for a couple of years and, uh, and you know, did, did the weather and did any, it was like a Kelly and Regis kind of show. Yeah. And, uh, and I did anything pertaining to a woman and commercials and that type thing. Page pageants too. You won a lot of pageants, it sounded like. I did what? A lot of the pageants that were out there, like, uh, uh, it sounded like you won a lot of contests. Well, I, I wasn't really, it wasn't a competitive thing. I think they were, yes, I was queen of the President's Cup Regatta in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. And that's where I met my husband, my first husband. The na in the na from the Navy, yeah. And then um, Queen of the uh, Winchester Apple Blossom Festival, Queen of the First International Azalea Festival. And all of those, I think, were because of who my mother was. Interesting. Because they always picked a queen or girl with someone in government. And my court was always the ambassador's daughters or, you know, the undersecretary's daughters or secretary, cabinet member's daughters. So it wasn't, it wasn't on beauty and talent. It's, again, it's all in who you know. It <laughs> always is. So I was, I was well connected. You were well connected is right. So I have, I have a question for you. It, I was just thinking about this. So your husband, your first husband was in the Navy and he gets transferred or, or sent out to California. So that right. was that just a total fluke then that you ended up in California to pursue your acting? It wasn't absolutely. like that's what you were trying um, to do. Absolutely. And I decided when I was there, I decided, well, I'm going to, um, maybe I'll, I'm a you know, young mother. I'll try doing commercials because I've done them you know, back in, in uh, Washington, D.C. Yeah. So yeah. I got an agent. And my very first commercial, which got me into the union, you know, the old story, you couldn't work unless you belonged to the union. You couldn't exactly. belong to the union unless you had work. Yep. So I went and it was a Kellogg's Rice Krispies. And we chatted and and then one of the questions, they said, um, do you belong to the union? And I said, no. And they said, well, we decided we want to use you. We want to cast you. And uh, we'd like you to go over to the union. We will call them and wow. tell them you have a job. And um, 
will will you know you can you have to be union. So that's how I got into the union because of a Kellogg's Rice Krispie commercial. Oh my gosh! Yeah, it's always been that way. It, you're absolutely right. It's like it's like a double edged sword. It's like wait a minute, I can't do it unless I'm in the union, but I can't be in the union unless I have the job. It's like there you go. Yeah, it makes no and sense. At the time when I went over and joined the union, it was a hundred dollars. Yeah, yeah. Kind of like it was thousand. It's thousands. It's thousands. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Well, so I good. have no idea, but I know it's right. in that. Right. And uh, so, and now, because of all the years, I'm on a union pension. Oh, well, that's great. Though. Not a lot, not a lot, but between right. my union pension and social security, I'm able to make it. Yeah, I think it's great. And that's that's something for every actor out there to go. Let's, you know, if you can get that, that's a big accomplishment. Um, oh, you got something there. Yeah. Um, so I have I have one last one last couple questions for you. I'm just curious. Mary Tyler Moore show. Um, oh, is I'm going to turn it off? Yes. Oh, yes. don't worry about it. No biggie. The Mary Tyler Moore show, you played uh, Betty White's or I, Su yeah. Sue Ann Nevins, but Betty White, her younger sister, I saw. I did. I And, and that was a fun job to do because um, she was from the South. She was from Georgia. And um, I had to do it with the Southern accent. Well, I lived in Virginia, and you know, I can you can pick up a lot of the the, sure. the words and the intonation and the voice. And so, when I read for the part, you know, they said, "Can I do a Southern accent?" I said, "Sure." So I did, and that kind of helped me get the part. Wow! Did how did you like working on that set, the Mary Tyler Moore set, compared to like the Mary monsters? Very nice. They were all very nice. Very, um, um, you know, just very, very helpful. Uh, very encouraging. It, it was a, a wonderful experience. What about Betty White? Um, what was it like? Oh, being she Betty was White? lovely. Oh, she was lovely. We laugh in between shots and things. She was lovely. Yeah, I've heard she's very giving, was very giving yes. person. Yes. Yeah. Wow. And then the other ones I saw were um, The Lucy Show, uh, Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea, oh. My Favorite Martian. Uh, the, the Lucy Show, I, I, did, I, I did the show when I played a stewardess on the airline and she was flying somewhere. And, but I knew Lucy one of my very good friends uh, was, um, had coached Lucy in singing. She was from Broadway oh. and they were in Wildcat together and, and, and she knew her very well. And Paula Stewart was her name. And she, um, she'd go up to Lucy's quite frequently. And one day she said to me, you want to go? I've got to stop by Lucy's. You want to go? And I said, sure. Lucy was always playing backgammon. She loved backgammon. Wow. Every day, every day playing backgammon. And um, so she was playing backgammon and they stopped and, and we chatted just a little bit. And she said to me, what size nice shoe do you wear? I said, eight and a half. And she said, Oh, well, so do I. She said, you know, they're by the back door. She said, I got a whole big uh, leaf bag full of shoes that are all eight and a half. And I'm just, I'm just going to give them to Goodwill or something. If you want them, take them. So I took them. Oh, my gosh. And one, but again, here we go. Another retirement fund. <laughs> I sold them in a garage sale, not as Lucy shoes, just shoes. However, I did keep one because it was in a box. The shoes were in the box and the box said L ball. I have those today. And it says L ball on the box. Oh, that's cool. So wow. 
Okay. Well, <laughs> they'll be garage sale, you know, dollar pair, no big deal. Yep, but you know what? That pair that you have with L ball is definitely very oh, valuable. Yeah, right, right. That's that, right. That will take care of a month in the home. It, <laughs> <laughs> and assisted living. That'll get me through one month. <laughs> I'm not there yet. Right. I'm not there yet. You are not even close. Forget that. <laughs> and by the way, congratulate you beat lymphoma. Am I right? Is that what it was? Yes, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. I mean, gosh, Pat, that's huge. Well, I am now, it's incurable, but uh -huh. it's treatable. And at the time when I, when I was diagnosed and I started treatment, one of the first questions I asked the doctor was, how long do I have? Sure, sure. And he said, well, he said about the six years. Hmm. He said, but, you know, there's a lot of new things in, in clinical trials, a lot of new medicines coming out. So I don't know, but just, you know, setting everything aside six years. Well, I'm now almost 22 years down. Oh, is that great? I have relapsed five times, but every time I go back, I have the same treatment every time, knocks it down, you know. And I, in fact, I just, just relapsed four months ago and went back into treatment, and, you know, for a month. Then I'm fine again. Everything's fine. Pat, that's so, amazing. That's amazing. Um, yeah, it, it was. I think my doctors and my medicine, I have to thank for and I think attitude also. Oh, come has on. Of course. Plays a lot to, to our own positivity and, and laughter. Yeah. What um last thing, and then and then I'll let you go. You've been so, so wonderful. Um, what uh, you know, I know that you said that you know you haven't had the chance to do a lot of the you know shows since the pandemic. What would you like to say to your fans? Because they're gonna be tuning in, believe me. Well, okay, I want to tell my fans, first of all, I miss all of you. I so look forward to seeing you at the shows and talking with you and, and you'd share your memories of the show, and, which, which was, you know, brought back wonderful memories for me. And I just thank you for being with me and being concerned and caring all these years. I mean, it, it's really meant a lot to me. I know I just had a birthday and I'm not on social media. And so I have no idea what's out there on me. I have no idea what's going on unless someone tells me. And uh, a friend of Butch's said, she knew, she said, you've had a lot, about 2000 hits on your birthday. And I said, well, if I text you a message can you post it so they can see it? And she said, yes, because I just wanted everyone to know how much I appreciated their thought. Because, you know, if it isn't for them, none of us would be where we are. It's all of our fan base, really is. You're they right keep about that. us where we are. That's so and I thank, I thank them. That's so and great. I thank you. This has been a wonderful interview. Oh my gosh, believe me. No, I, I have I have loved talking with you. You know, something that you said, by the way, that really, um, I thought you really hit it on the head. I saw you in an interview and you said that part of the reason that that time that the Munsters is so special that, you know, Lost in Space, all these shows that were happening around that time is because those there were only a couple of networks at the time. And when you sat down, the whole family sat down and you all watched together. And so there was a bond. Absolute. Yeah. That were that was the shows of the 60s. They were a lot of wonderful family shows projecting family and life. Um, they had morals, they had um, they had a theme, messages, many of them. Uh, and these they were shows the families watched together. And at that time, families were together. 
-hmm. And I've had many people come up at shows and tell me that their memory is when their family was all together when they were watching the movie, which was very sad to me because mm -hmm. they don't have that anymore. That's why so many people, when they come to the shows, would say to me, you know, the shows of the 60s are the only shows I let my children watch. Yeah. And that because the language, the, the content, and uh, maybe the, the um, lesson to be learned or whatever. Yeah. I, I hear you. I hear you. Because people always say, why, why are they still around? Like, what is it about it? But I think you hit it on the head. I think that that was well said. But hey, Pat, thanks a bunch. I mean, I, I really enjoyed it. And, I, and thanks okay, for like- Thank you. I enjoyed it too. I'm sorry we had a little bit of problems in the beginning, but thank you so much. No, nah, don't worry about it. That's, that's part of the fun. You. Oh well, it's been it's been a it's been a blast, Pat. And I and I I wish you all the best. And uh, you know, stay strong. And just oh. uh, thanks for being such a good representative. Oh, thank of thank you. Anytime you want to talk, give me a call. All right, I appreciate that, Pat. I thanks. haven't lost my ability to talk. Maybe <laughs> think, not talk. Thanks a bunch, Pat. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Hey, don't forget to hit the subscribe button in the corner of the video. And if you like the video, please hit the like button as well. And while you're here, take a look at some of the other great interviews from anybody from Jerry Mathers to Butch Patrick to Judy Norton. All fantastic. Have a great one.